We're here today in the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Jewish Messiah who died for the sins of all. He was the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, who commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Yeshua came the first time, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ came the first time to suffer as a servant. The second time he will not come in the same way. The second time when Jesus comes, he will come as a conquering king to crush the enemies of Israel under his feet and deliver them from their enemies. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, says that Jesus, Yeshua, was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we can be healed. Interesting. Jesus is Lord. He is the King of Israel. He is the King of Jerusalem. He'll put his feet down on the Mount of Olives, not far from here, at the end of this age. And he will rule for a thousand years on this earth. His name is Yeshua, Jesus. This must be the youth march, bro. The day before. The less dangerous one. True frat freedom is found in Jesus. True freedom is found in Yeshua. He offers you freedom from your sin. Yeshua said when he was on earth, Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. He said he that commits sin is a slave to sin and the slave will not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Hashem Adonai sent his son, Jesus, Yeshua, to this earth for 2,000 years ago, born of a virgin with a sinless and perfect life. He was born in Bethlehem, raised up in Nazareth. He suffered and bled and died under the Romans, the Jewish authorities. He died on a Roman cross, suffered and bled and died for your sins that you might receive forgiveness of sins and cleansing of sins. That's the only way. It's the only way Hashem has provided, that Adonai has provided for you to receive the forgiveness and mercy He offers you. It's through what His Son did on the cross for you and for me. Without Yeshua, there is no eternal life. Without Jesus, there is no offer of mercy. I'm going to pause for a second. They sound like they're praying. Amen. What are they doing? Uh, well, Jerusalem Day is tomorrow. Uh, Jerusalem Day so is So they're tomorrow. walking through uh, Damascus Gate, the adults are. I think it's just the kids. And they're going to march through here today. Uh, okay. Pretty sure that's what's going on. They're praying right now, worshiping.
What's that? You run a tour? By what? You, you run a tour? Oh no, I'm just, I'm actually preaching the gospel. Oh yeah. I stopped because they were doing that. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a Christian who wants to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Good man. About yourself? Uh, well, I'm, I, just visiting? I come every year. Okay. But I serve as a, as a chef. I'm a chef. Okay. And um, so various different communities, different projects. Wherever food, as you know, is a massive part of the gospel. And uh, so I ask the Lord to sort of use my hands in that way. And um, I, I, since I've been here, I've been doing some cooking in... I'm being Bethlehem cooking tomorrow. Okay. But I've been doing some around the, around the corner, just by Damascus, on the other side of the uh, Damascus Gate. Yeah. And um, yeah, so yeah, just uh, hoping that um, through through food. Where are you coming from? Yeah, London. London. Okay. Yeah. yeah. From Georgia in America. Georgia. Yeah. What's what's the thing in Georgia? What's the big thing? Is it Atlanta? Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the big thing in Georgia. Not much. It's called the Peach State, but. If you drive around Georgia, you're not going to find very many peaches, so I don't know why it's called the Peach State. Oh. And what about uh, sports, which is the big thing there? Atlanta Hawks, Atlanta Falcons. Right. Um, those are two big. That's oh, football, isn't it? Football's Falcons, yeah. Hawks is basketball. And the Atlanta Braves, their baseball, they win the championship pretty often, it seems like. And do you come here with a church, or are you just on your own out here? I am a pastor, but it's me and my friend, my brother in Christ here. This is the third time I've been to Israel. First time I came as a tour. Yep. To just see lots of the sights. With an evangelist group, we did a little bit of evangelist, but not much. Fell in love. Well, second time, yeah, of course. I mean, just it's, the Bible comes alive to you. Almost, it does. You know? It does. Yeah. Se second time, I came with a group of five people. Mm. We did mostly evangelism with a little bit of touring. Mm. This time, I didn't really doing touring at all, just doing evangelism. So we preached in Tel Aviv for two days. Me and all my right. friend yesterday, we're here in Jerusalem. Yeah. We're hoping to go to a lot on, on Friday to preach there. So. That's, that's the plan. That's that's awesome, man. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the, the it's nice that we can still come here and serve as as, um, as believers yeah. in, in in lots of capacities. It's yeah. ironically so free to do that. I know. It's it's it's, a, it's an unusual. And some don't like that freedom. No, they don't. They tried to pass a law recently, but didn't didn't they go. They did earlier in the year. Actually, yeah. that, that was the turning point to see whether or not I would even come because the churches that I'm involved in here. They're, um, I mean, they're, some would call them radical. They're not radical, they just love Jesus. Yeah. They just want to share the gospel. Yeah. But they would have been amongst the crowds, that, amongst the people that would have been really shut down quite, quite badly. Yeah. So thank God that didn't happen. Amen. But the thing is, you know, Christians bring a lot of tourism in. They would, I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu, I, I don't know how, how, you know, how, how he feels about the gospel. I know people have shared it with him before, but as far as like, He's not a Christian, obviously, or a Messianic Jew. Yeah, but, but there is something. But he understands yeah, yeah, business. Yeah. He's like the Trump of Israel. Yeah, you know, he, he understands he's the business. Trump of Israel, yeah. He understands yeah. that if he does that, he's going to lose a lot of business. Yeah, yeah. They're going to a poor country overnight. Yeah, they would. Because the thing is, the the the, the Muslims here, they they work on the other side of town. Yeah. Um, this side of town, you could sell. I mean, for example, you go east, and you know you're in Arab territory. That's right. You know, you're going to buy a falafel sandwich for 10 shekels. Yeah. Buy the same, same same falafel sandwich here for up to 30. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's a simple calculation. That's right. If, if you're looking at it from that point of view. Yes, they got, they got one third the income over there. I mean, you know. Up a sandwich. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and but they would never approve of free speech there. I mean, no. Well, Islam friend, would be destroyed pretty quickly. My friend's school is a Christian school in Bethlehem. Okay. Which is a very dangerous place to sure. have a Christian school. And he, um, that's where I am tomorrow. And he's had, he's had like stuff thrown through the window and he's had to, and he's, and, you know, the last time I saw him last year, he said, we just put, we intensified our message. We put, we put crosses in the window. We put a big cross outside by the gate, and I'm like, well, instead wow. of backing down, you push forward. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, it's, it's a real gift to be able to do that. Amen. I think uh, without having to sort of, but he's he's fearless, and uh, and actually, yeah, he's um, he's a, he's a, he's a, they've got a really interesting and amazing school as well, and they've got um, they've managed they've managed to find Christian staff from the Arab community and from the Jewish community, so. Um, it is pretty amazing. Mm. You do, you see amazing things here. Yeah. Amazing things that you won't see, you know, in, in America and certainly in England. Yeah. You can choose your church. There's yeah. that much selection. Yeah. You know, you come to a country where you find a, a Christian, great. You know, you yeah. lock it down with that one because you don't know how many 
but it, we, we kind of waste our freedom in a, in a beer in the UK. You know, it, it's, it's taken for granted. You can literally... You're kind of eating it through that way at yeah. this point in time, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, London is overrun with Muslims now, isn't it? Muslim mayor, right? And Muslim uh, authorities. Well, the, 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 the prime minister is a Hindu. The mayor, Sadiq Khan, he's a, he's a Muslim. But Muslim... Uh, groups have taken over local councils as well, so there are parts of the uh, parts of London that are just yeah they're, they're massively massively growing in that yeah yeah. Um, but the thing is, they uh, according to scripture, I know they'll come to faith before well, these guys do. Yeah, they're going to come to faith in a big way. Yeah, and you can see that priming up. When Jesus that, returns. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you, you can and and some are coming to the faith now. It's it's, it's kind of yeah yeah ramping up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's not going down. It's going up a going little up, bit. Yeah. Eventually, when he comes, everybody they all get saved. You know that uh, when I went to Nazareth for the first time, I didn't realize this until I went there. I met. I was with an. I was with a Christian Arab community there, and and I was. Yeah, I was probably the last person on earth to find this out. I didn't realize that there had been an Arab Christian community. Six hundred years before the birth of Islam. Islam was six hundred, and prior to that. The Arab Christian community was massive, yep. and they've kind of they've stayed within the family. There's a there's a there's a massive community of Christian Arabs that have never been anything right. other than Christian, right. and that is an amazing thing to see. You, you go to a worship, you go to church, and you know worship services and stuff like that, and it's all in Arabic. Hey, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And the church is really flourishing in Iran. Oh yeah, underground. Underground. The church is a group called FAI who does a lot of work there, and. They're raising up Iranians to be witnesses to their own people. It's underground, but uh, it's really growing by leaps and bounds. It's kind of like the church in China, to some degree, how that grows underground. It's not out in the open like we are right now, preaching the gospel, handing out gospel tracts, witnessing, you know, like big groups. You're, you're kind of doing it one to one, and but people are getting saved. They're having dreams of, of Jesus, and it's really affecting that group. So God's God's doing work in the Muslim community in Iran, big time. And probably other places too that I'm not aware of. So he's always working. Well, I'm, I'm thankful we'll be a part of it, you know. Well, I'm going to exercise my my. I'm going to contribute my little bit and pray for you, brother. Oh, Tillich, I appreciate right that. Right here, yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God. It's the first time I've done this actually, so I'm going to say thank you so much, Lord, for this brother. What's your name? Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Yeah. Kerrigan. Yeah. Um, Lord, it takes uh, it takes a special gift, and it really does take uh, a love of you that is so strong to to not just want to do this but to come and convict and armor up with all the gear and to just take the whole commitment take the whole thing by both hands and say i'm going to do it and lord it, it is this is such an amazing place to serve it's such an amazing place to share the gospel and i pray for kerrigan and his team lord for their safety but i also pray lord jesus for, for much fruit to come out of their ministry and i pray lord jesus that you would um, anoint this ministry um, and that you would stand with them and that you would give them great messages and that they would have an effect on the ground that they stand on today and Lord this is a this is an amazing thing that his team are doing and Lord Jesus you're at the heart of it we do it because we yes. love you yes, Lord. we do it because we love you yes. and we do it because we want to see people saved we we you cried over the city because you saw the pain past and present you see everything that was going to happen here yes, and um, it made you cry Lord and um, it is a sad thing but Lord those that cry with you and actually want to stand in that emotion and say I will love you and I want to save you I want to bring you to Jesus so um, I just pray Lord God for great power to come out of this man uh, and his team in Jesus name Amen Amen Thank you brother what's your name again? Sunil Sunil yeah good to meet you brother yeah you too yeah, bless you. yeah all right I'll see you around sometime soon I hope so I'm, I'm back uh, I'm going I'm leaving in a day or two so okay. when you but when are you leaving then? uh Saturday night late uh you're not here tomorrow you're in Elat uh Friday in Elat ah uh, here to, you're here tomorrow yes same spot probably yeah oh, I'm, I might I'm, I'm I might bring some food I'm cooking chicken curry oh wow so I might bring some up here you that can sounds, have some chicken curry sounds good yeah. all right then brother Praise same God. time tomorrow then, yeah you're about the same time yeah, all right, then, brother, yeah. God bless you, all right, you too. thank you <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is Lord of all. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the Son of God. 
He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's God in flesh. He died on a Roman cross almost 2,000 years ago, but death could not hold him. He laid his life down to the hands of lawless men who beat him and bruised him and crucified him. He was dead, he was buried, he rose again the third day, defeating death. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he commands all men everywhere to repent, because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Hashem sent his son, Yeshua. He was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth. He died in Jerusalem, not far from here, near the Here the Garden of Gethsemane is where he died, somewhere in that area. But he lived on this place 2,000 years ago. He walked among his people. He's from the tribe of Judah. He's a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But he's the king of kings. But not just the king of Israel, he's the king of kings. And the first time Yeshua came, Jesus came, he suffered as a servant, willingly. No one took his life from him. He laid down his life. But the second time he comes, he's not going to be suffering. The second time Yeshua comes, he's going to destroy the enemies of Israel. He's going to install a judgment day. He's going to judge you according to what's written in the books. And I encourage you to give up your sin, to follow him, to obey him, to serve him. He commands all men everywhere to repent. The scripture says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. According to the scriptures, there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. In the old covenant, there was a temple, there was a holy of holies, where the high priest went once a year to offer a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, to put the blood on the mercy seat on the top of the ark, but it was done in the Old Covenant to receive forgiveness of sins. But the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, started a new covenant in His blood, a new covenant in His blood that was shed on the cross. A once-for-all sacrifice for sins was Jesus. And he has the authority given to him by the Father. The Father has given Jesus the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Nor is there salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved besides Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the greatest Jew ever, the greatest man ever. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave the blind eyes to see. He gave the mute a loose tongue to speak. He gave the deaf ears to hear. He cleansed the leper. He raised the dead. There can never be a greater man, a greater Israeli, a greater Jew than Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. He rose from the grave, defeating death. Tell me someone who has risen from the grave by his own power. Tell me one person who has risen from the grave by his own power. Tell me one person who has given eyes to see to the blind, has given the, F, the deaf ears to hear. Even when he was on earth, when people would falsely accuse him of who he was, saying he was not of God, the people would say, who could be greater than this? Who can give the blind eyes to see? Who could get the deaf ears to hear? He fulfilled the prophecies about his first coming. And the Old Testament prophets, he fulfilled these prophecies, showing who he is. And even with eyes to see, with a heart to seek and to know the truth, can see who Jesus Christ is, who he was when he came to this earth. You have to put aside the man-made doctrines, 
Put aside the blindness, open your eyes, and stiffen your necks, open your ears to hear who Jesus is, who Yeshua is. There's so many people who trust in the words of men, the doctrines of men, the traditions of men. Are you really willing to bank your whole eternal existence on a book, on books of men, on doctrines of men and traditions of men and rabbis and teachers? Why would you not bank your eternity on the word of God instead? God has given you his word, the scriptures, the Old and New Testaments. He's given it to you that you may know the truth, that you might walk in lies no longer, that you might be deceived no longer, but, not, but might know the truth of God. He's made his truth clear and plain for anyone who reads. In our day and age, there's more access to the scriptures than ever before. You'll have no excuse when you stand before God to give an account of your life for why you did not receive Jesus, Yeshua, as your Lord and Savior, as your King, the King of your life, where you submit your life unto Him and walk with Him and love Him and obey Him. That's what He commands you to do. Yeshua, when He was on earth, walking in this land 2,000 years ago, He told people to go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. He commanded all men everywhere to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Christ will come in his kingdom someday when he returns, when he comes for the second time. The scripture says that he will send out his angels and he will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. But then the righteous, and only the righteous, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, when the scripture says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, it's not talking about those who have fleshly pieces of skin on the side of their face, on the sides of their head. Everybody has those for the most part. It's talking about whether you're willing to listen to what the Word of God says, to put aside what men tells you, and what teachers and traditions tell you. You know, Yeshua, Jesus, he dealt with those who had traditions of men. And he said, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their, their lips, but their heart is far from me. You're going to be missing the kingdom of God because your heart is not right with God. You're not ready to stand before God and give an account of your life. Or you can become ready. Simply open the scriptures, read it, believe it, obey it. Yes, obedience is required. What good does it do to have religious rituals? What good is it to have religious traditions? But a lack of obedience to God. What good does it do you? It does you no good. And in the prophet Isaiah's time, people were like that. They had their traditions lined up in a row. They made sure the traditions were done. They offered the sacrifices. They did the festivals. But they were wicked. They were sinful. And he said, put away your sacrifice. I want them no longer. He did not desire their sacrifice because their heart was far from him. And there's so many like this today. Whether we're talking about Jews or Christ professing Christians, there's so many people today who are not right with God. Follow Yeshua, Hamashiach, follow Jesus Christ. He commands you to. He is your only hope. He's the only hope you have to receive forgiveness of sins. Is Yeshua. You have no temple. If you're a Jewish person, you have no temple. You have no Levites, you have no high priest, you have no sacrifices to offer. You're not obeying the Tanakh. The Tanakh, Tanakh commands you to offer up sacrifices, which you're not doing. You haven't done it since AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. I wonder why. Because Yeshua was killed about 40 years earlier. 
the final sacrifice for sins once for all. Yeshua died for all of those who live, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And Yeshua, we all know about his death on a Roman cross, but he rose from the grave. He defeated death. He appeared to all his disciples. He appeared to over 500 people at one time. Even his opponents knew it happened because the Roman soldiers who were employed to watch the tomb, they were there when it happened. They were fearful when it happened. And the religious leaders who knew what happened paid them off to spread a lie. It's amazing. How many signs do you have to get? How many miracles did Yeshua have to do to convince them that he is who he says he is? You see, if someone does not have a heart for the truth, then a seeker or a lover of the truth, doesn't matter how much truth you give them, it goes in one ear out the other. It's like, it's like water on a rock, just flows over top of it. A hard heart, a stiffened neck, but God is patient. He is long-suffering towards us. He's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The fact that you're still alive, that you're still in your sins, whatever your sins may be, whether your sins are religious sins or they're just wickedness, fornication, lying, stealing, homosexuality, all sins God is against. And whatever your sins are, God is patient with you. He's long-suffering towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But he will not suffer. He will not be patient forever. There's coming a time. There's coming a day where you're going to have to answer for your sins. You're going to have to answer for your life. If you have not received forgiveness of sins through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, it'll be too late for you. Hello. Uh. How are you? Uh, you know, maybe the people don't like it, but you do. That's fine. It doesn't matter if they like it or not. I'm here to obey God, not no, them. I know it's your, uh, your uh, religion. I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, go ahead. So we come here in the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. This is his city. There's so many people who want this city. They want to have control over the city. Jews, Christians, Muslims. There's been a fight over this city for a very long time. It's in the control of the Israelis for a long time. So it belongs to them, in my opinion. And then it was under the control of, of the Romans. And then the Crusades happened, and then we have the Ottoman Empire. So many people fighting over control of Jerusalem. Why is that? This city truly belongs to Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. It belongs to him. It's the city of our great king who will return his throne. He will rule the earth from here. Jesus Christ will rule the earth from here, from Jerusalem, when he returns. He'll rule for a thousand years. You have to prepare yourself, prepare yourself for his return. Prepare yourself for his return to this place. It is going to happen whether you believe it or not. Your lack of belief in it will not change the facts. He will rule from this place. His name is Yeshua. In America, we call him Jesus. But he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He died for you. Jesus died for you. The scripture says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. If you're living in sin, you're not right with God. Coming to this place, coming to this country, coming to this city will not make you right with God. This place will not give you God's mercy and forgiveness. 
That's only found through Jesus, Yeshua. He is, your own, he is the only way. There is no other way. Your religious deeds, your money, your tithes, your offerings will not buy you entrance into God's kingdom. God's kingdom is open only to those who turn from their sin, who turn in childlike, humble faith to Yeshua, Jesus, who become born again of the Holy Spirit and live a life of obedience to Him. There is no other way. He is the only way. He is the only truth, the only life. That's what he said about himself, and he's not a man that he, not a man that he should lie. He's God in flesh. He's Emmanuel, God with us, the Son of God. Are you ready to stand before him? So many people have a pseudo-religion. A religion does not exalt God did not exalt Yeshua. In America, where I come from, there's so many people who claim to be Christians but live hypocritical lives. They don't know God. They're lying to themselves. Hypocrites will end up in hell just like Muslims and Hindus and those who believe in false religions. By the mercy of God, God is patient with you. But do not wait any longer. Turn from your sin. Turn to Yeshua in humility and childlike faith. Follow him and obey him. He is your only hope. He is your only way to receive forgiveness of sins is through Yeshua, Jesus, who died for you on the cross. As Isaiah 53 says, he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, you can be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon Yeshua the iniquity of us all. In Isaiah chapter 1, the scripture says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you are willing and obedient. You must be willing to come to Yeshua, Jesus, in humility, childlike humility, realizing your need, your desperate need for salvation in his name, realizing your desperate need for mercy and forgiveness of sins, which he alone can offer you. Come to him in humility and faith, believing the gospel of Yeshua, Jesus, repenting of your sins, turning from them all together, and begin to walk out in obedient faith to him. That's his command to you. He wants you to be saved. Saved from your sins. Saved from judgment and hell. Saved from the wrath of God. He offers it to you, his salvation. He stretches out his hand to you. Yeshua Jesus stretches out his hand to you that you might receive forgiveness of sins, that you might get what you don't deserve, which is the mercy of God. We've all sinned against God in some way, hundreds of times, thousands of times. We're all deserving of the wrath and judgment of God. Because of his great mercy, because of his great kindness, he sent Jesus, Yeshua, to die for us on the cross almost 2,000 years ago. Born of the Virgin Miriam, born in the town of Bethlehem, raised up in Nazareth, priests all throughout Galilee, Capernaum, Jerusalem, when he was alive on this earth. He preached the truth. And his people, for the most part, rejected him. Even though it was obvious that he's the Messiah, they rejected him. But he still stretched out his hand. 
He still stretched out his hand of mercy. He says, come to me, and I will give you rest. The life of sin, whether it's religious sin or just regular old sin, the life of sin is the burden life. It's a heavy burden to bear. It's one I remember fairly well and have no desire to go back to. No, King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, which he wrote in chapter 12, verse 13, he says, after looking at all of life, through the eyes of a man without God, Solomon said this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Are you doing that? Do you fear God? Do you keep his commandments? According to King Solomon, this is your all. For God, Hashem, will bring... Elohim will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Many of you have secret sin, sin you think you're hiding. You may even be successfully hiding it from other people, but it's not hidden from God. Your sin is not hidden from God. Your sin is out in the open. God sees it. And Proverbs 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. The eyes of Adonai, of Yahweh, are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. What has Hashem seen in your life today? Is he pleased with the way you're living? Are you living a righteous life? Are you living a wicked life? In the inward parts, anyone can put on a mask can outwardly look like they're righteous. The Pharisees of Jesus' time were just like that. And Yeshua said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisee, which is hypocrisy. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nothing hidden that will not be made known. Jesus, Yeshua, saw it. The Father, Adonai, Hashem, he sees sin. He sees your thoughts, your words, your deeds. Put them away. Turn to Yeshua, Jesus. In Him alone is eternal life. In Him alone is mercy from God. In Him alone can you receive the forgiveness of God. Only through Jesus, Yeshua. He loves you at the cross. And He commands all men everywhere to repent. Because there's coming a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness. Are you ready? Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Or even more, immediately, are you ready for your own death? Friends, none of us are guaranteed today, let alone tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. None of us are guaranteed to live to the 75-year mark that most do. You could die today. Turn to him while you still can. The scripture says, whereas we do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. What will you do, friends, when your life vanishes away, and you're not right with God? You don't have the mercy of God in your life for your sins. The forgiveness of God found through Jesus, Yeshua. What will you do then? There's no hope for you after the grave if you're not right with God. Are you righteous before God? Truly. Search yourself. Examine your heart. See what's on the inward parts. Anyone can put on a front. Anyone can be righteous externally. Appreciate that. Anyone can. But God desires to clean you on the inside. Cleanse out your heart. Jeremiah 31 talks about this, a new covenant, where God removes a hard heart of stone and gives you a soft heart of flesh and causes you to walk in his ways. Yeshua, Jesus, calls it becoming born again. In John chapter 3 of the New Testament, 
And Yeshua said to Nicodemus, a religious leader of his time, a Pharisee of his time, he said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, in his natural mindset, said, well, how can a man enter his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus was astonished. How could you, a ruler of Israel, a teacher of Israel, not understand these things? When Jeremiah 31 predominantly talks about it as a new covenant, that's what God, Hashem, Adonai, wants to do for you. He wants to remove your heart of stone, your hard heart, your stiffened neck, your closed ears, and give you a soft heart, a pliable heart, pliable to him as he, he is your maker to do as he commands you to do. We are the clay. He is the potter. He wants to mold us and make us into the person he wants us to be. Is he able to do that with you? Is he able to do that with you? Do you have a soft heart that can be molded the way Jesus Yeshua wants to mold it? Or are you hard-hearted and stiff in the neck? The fact is, as I said before, you may not have much time left. You could die today. King David in Psalm 39 said, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may see how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Your life's a vapor. I'm, I'm in my mid-40s now. It seems like my life has just flown by just like this. Just like I was a kid yesterday. And many of you can say the same thing. You watch your kids grow up, you have grandkids now, and life just flies by. That's the facts. But the scripture teaches your life is like a vapor. So cry out to the Lord to number your days, to walk a life of wisdom. The scripture talks about living in wisdom. But the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And by the fear of God, one departs from evil. If you fear God, you won't be sinning, that's for sure. The scripture says the fear of God is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than fine the gold. Yes, much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The scripture says the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. The scripture says in mercy and truth, atonement, Yeshua, Jesus, was provided for iniquity. And by the fear of God, one departs from evil. Once again, Yeshua, New Testament, Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. He said, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. That's the fear of God's important. That message is not heard enough. If there's more fear of God in this world, there'd be sure would be a less, lot less sin. And the scripture says the wages of sin is death. In Ezekiel 18, that the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteous of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But why should you die in your sins? God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. That's God's desire for you, that you don't die in your sins and go to hell. Now, King David in Psalm 66 said this. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now, there are many people who pray, who pray and pray and pray and pray. 
but they're not right with God. They have sin in their heart. They have sin in their life, sin coming out of their mouth, sin in their thoughts. And David said, that's true. If you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear. He will not pay attention to your prayers. You remove the sin, get rid of the sin, forsake the sin. Otherwise, there's no hope for you. The scripture says that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ, Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus Christ died for us. What the scripture says. In due time, when we're still without strength, Christ, Yeshua, died for the ungodly. You see? The Father Hashem's love was demonstrated in such a way that He showed it in a way that it was not deserved. That's what love is. Love is not deserved. Love is sacrificial. So He showed His love for you. And the main way the Father has shown His love to all of humankind is at that cross. When Jesus, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, died for us all. Praise the Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach is risen. Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah of Israel, prophesied in the Tanakh prophesied in the Tanakh has come, died in this city, rose again, and Mashiach is coming again. And there's a whole lot of buzz in Israel. Mashiach is coming, Mashiach is coming. Yes, he is. He is coming. He's coming again. And the Bible says that when he comes, Israel will recognize him because he'll come to destroy Israel's enemies that are attacking Jerusalem. But what you've missed is his first coming. What you've missed is his first coming. When Moshe said in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, Moses said, Moshe, the Lord your God will raise up to you a prophet, the Messiah, from the midst of thee, from inside of you, from Israel, and of, thy, of your brothers, like to me, unto him you shall hearken, you shall listen to, you shall listen to him, the Mashiach. Moses is commanding you to listen to the Mashiach when he comes. According to all that you desire of the Lord, your God, and for in the day of the assembly, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. And it says in verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet, and it says, He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken to, the, to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So Hashem told the children of Israel through Moses that when Mashiach comes, when Mashiach comes, you have to hearken to what he says. And if you don't listen to what he says, then you will be held accountable for it. You'll be held accountable for it. And how do you know who the Mashiach is? It's all over the Tanakh. It's all over the Tanakh. What does David say in Psalm 2? David. David says in Psalm 2. He says this. He says, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled a little bit. It also says in verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord said unto me, You are my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Indicating that God has a son, a future begotten son, Yeshua, the Messiah. What else does David say in Psalm 22? What does it say in Psalm 22? Shalim 22. 
says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeshua said these words on the cross when he was dying. My God, and why did Yeshua say that? Why did Yeshua say, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? Do you even know? This is your Mashiach. He was identifying himself with the prophecy in Psalm 22, where it says this. In, in verse 16, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. It's not talking about the knee. David wasn't pierced in his hands and his feet, but Yeshua was. You see? So when Yeshua was on the cross dying, saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was identifying himself with Psalm Talim 22, which is a messianic prophecy. The Mashiach. And it says, my hands and my feet, they have pierced. They have pierced. Yeshua ben Joseph and Yeshua ben David are the same. The same man. What else does the Tanakh say about the Mashiach? Shalom! Shalom! Bogerto! <laughs> no. Laila to. Shalom Yerushalayim. It says in Isaiah chapter 9, For unto us is born a son, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is the Mashiach that was prophesied all over. Zechariah. Zechariah, chapter 12. What does it say? Zechariah chapter 12, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and, uh, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Who, who is God talking about? God is speaking right like now. God. Can I ask you some Hashem questions? Hashem sure, go for it. Hey, Sam, what's your name? Shmuel. Shmuel. Yeah, Samuel. Said, Kerrigan. Oh, uh, same name. No, no. Kerrigan. I said Samuel. I know it means. Oh, Julian my Santa. name. I thought. Uh, no, no. It's Kerrigan. Oh, I'm first, Irish. First I, don't, last I, don't have the, I don't have the Hebrew name. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, my hands so my feet. I, I hear what you guys are doing here, mm -hmm. and why not? And you're trying to and correct me if I'm wrong, Isaiah, but you're trying to say you have to Isaiah prove a point. You have to go by a certain uh, like level to say son. this is why I'm right. And they shall correct? Be as like this is why you should come and follow me, Mashiach, or follow Jesus. We'll go with that. Follow Jesus. Well, I mean. I'm not going to reason someone to believe that you. you. I'm not going to like, reason them into it, like intellectually. Feet, no. Well, I mean, we can talk. I don't have a problem reasoning about it. Okay. I'm just saying that's not going to make you get saved. I'm not going to make you trust in your Well, that's what the scripture says. So I believe the scripture over you. No okay, so can I, can I ask it this way then? Uh, so you know the Shema? I don't know. I don't know. Right, so, so it says, um, Why? Is real. Lord God, Lord is one. Right, right, right. And that continues. Why? And, then, and, and you keep on going at Why it. Why do you accept you Yeshua? To know God. So the, I think personally there's a difference between knowing and believing. Sure. Yeah, but knowing God is a relationship. Okay. Not just knowing about Him. For sure. You can know about a bunch of right, celebrities, but, we don't but, know them. But we have to prove that He exists. No, no. You don't have to prove He exists. Absolutely not. So, so, how, so how do you know you're right then? Well, here's the thing. I don't, I don't have to prove God exists any more than I have to prove that my lungs exist, or my brain exists, or my heart exists, or this earth exists. It's, God doesn't seek to prove Himself that He exists. He simply declares it. That's why atheism is so foolish. I agree with that. And we also can both agree that way back in the day, even in like Greek, right in Jesus, Euro, ancient Greek, you that people would be killed for being atheists because they didn't have anything why to believe in. Right? There but might have been some. But I still think there's a difference between believing and knowing. The ultra yes, there are different between believing the and knowing. I agree with that. Okay, but, but so knowing when it, it says in the Torah, but, no, no. but knowing in the scripture, the primarily, 
It's not a head knowledge. It's a experiential knowledge, a relational knowledge. I, don't, I would disagree with that. Okay, that's fine. Because you have to have a foundation. Hashem gave you. If your foundation's on water, you're going to sink. But if your foundation's on land, but, but, concrete, you're going to rise. The kind of arguments an atheist would use, for example, is like I was talking to a guy in Tel Aviv okay. recently. Okay. He's a Jew, okay. but he's not a religious Jew. He's like a secular Jew. Okay? Okay. And he was he basically muddied the water and said, we can't ever know anything for sure. You listen to what he says. But here's the because thing. I agree. I disagree with it too, obviously. Okay. But my, my point is, if, if, if we're trying to say, I wasn't there when Moses wrote, wrote the first five books. So I can't prove Moses wrote the first five books. With the house of Israel. That's what he said. But I don't know about that 100%. Not according to the law of Moses. Because I would say this. If you can prove that God exists, then you could prove that the Torah is real. And everything that happened in it actually happened. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. That Moses wrote the Torah. So, so I, I mean, obviously, I, I know you have a biased opinion. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that I preach on college campuses in America. Okay. So I talk to atheists all the time. You guys are from Georgia? Yes. I, I destroy. No atonement for sin. South Atlanta. I destroy their arguments all the time. I can prove God exists. I have no problem proving God exists. I have the ability to do that. The impossibility of the contrary is the sure proof God exists. But. That's different between that and saying that, well, we know for a fact Moses wrote the first five books. The that's, the point, that's the point the guy from Tel Aviv was making. Okay. There's, a, there's a jump there, obviously. So, so my point is that, is that there has to be a faith element there. And faith is not blind, obviously, okay. but it's not based upon, like, I went through a step and I proved everything for sure. I knew everything for sure because the Bible teaches that you have that childlike faith. Heart, you have any children? Do they just believe what you say, or did they, 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 they try to prove everything first? I How actually tell possible? them to question everything I tell But no, 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 no. when you give them a command, do they always question everything you say, or do they just go do it? In, in what aspect? Well, you tell them, go Why clean up your room. Okay. You tell them, go get ready for dinner. I don't know that's best to be able to Go take a bath. Go brush your teeth. Whatever it may be, if you're telling your children just they have, if they have a childlikeness to them, they're they're believing you. They're, they're relying upon you for information to give you to, for you to give them accurate information. So that so when it comes to the scriptures, Yeshua said the same thing. You must come with childlike faith. Okay. Because the ones who are the skeptics, the, 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 the perpetual skeptics, they're not going to receive eternal life. Okay. Because they're constantly skeptical about everything. So uh, I don't, I don't get that aspect. Yeah. 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 I say one thing, Dad. What he said a moment sure, ago. The word God says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and that's why God has His men and myself out here. Yeah. Okay. What did Yeshua say? So remember when Deuteronomy 17. I think one of the uh, proof to say that uh, God is real and the Torah is true is to say about kosher animals, right? So in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus, the of Leviticus it says that you can eat any animal that has a completely split hoof and choose its cut. Okay. So therefore, you can eat anything that has that. And then the Torah goes on to say, there are going to be four animals that have one sign and not the other. And then it goes even further to say, here are the names and the sign that they don't have. Okay? And so now we go about it and we can say, well, we have one, you find one animal that has one of those signs and not the other that are not the four listed, you just disprove the Torah. Well, I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't go that far because I would. it, it doesn't say in that passage, these are the only four animals in the history of mankind. Yes, it, it says that? Yes, Show it to me. Okay. Hold it up. Yeah. You, you have a Bible? I have one on my app, but I don't really like it. Oh, is, it, it, it is it in Hebrew? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, mean, I could read it to you in Hebrew. What, what's you what's, the, verse, what's the verses we're talking about? Um, I think it's going to be Leviticus chapter like 12, maybe? Fulfilled that time. Let me Mashiach look it has up. come, according to the scriptures. Yes, Mashiach is coming That's again, and you're waiting for him. after childbirth. That can't be it. You're waiting okay, for his second coming. He will come in the clouds and destroy the enemies um, of Israel. <laughs> and he'll rule and reign from this city right and here. And while he's looking that up, since you brought up lambs, I would remind you of what Abraham first, said to Isaac because they were going to Mount Moriah raised. before he was about ready to that slay his own son. Remember okay. what he said? God will provide but himself a lamb. First. He didn't say God will provide for himself. So. He, he for said provide himself a lamb, meaning he would become as the lamb. That's sure. 
the lamb of God was taken away the city. I mean, in that sense, the lamb was there because God provided the lamb. There's a reason in the book. And that was a picture of Messiah as our substitute, so that way you and I don't have to die just like Isaac didn't have to die. And I say Okay, so oh, don't miss the Mashiach. these shall also be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep Behold among the earth, right. the mole, this the mouse, and the large Israel. lizard after its kind, the, the gecko, the mock lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. Right. That. That's more than four, by the way. Now, I mean, that's not kosher animals. This is talking about yeah, the Yeah, I understand. Mashiach. Right, right. It's talking specifically about unclean. kosher animals. Right here is the 24, we're talking about the ones that are... Wisely, he shall be exalted and swallowed in very high. As so many as were astonished ever go at him, his image and they shall be unclean the like these. Okay, I hear that's that. That's Yeshua. Yeshua was beaten by his own people, crucified okay. by Gentiles. Okay, let me go his try and find another person. Out. He was whipped. He was stripped naked. A crown of thorns was placed see. on his head. Why? Because God, Hashem, was preparing an atonement for you. I have no problem getting together with you and meeting up with you somewhere. At the same time, the okay. Pharisees were preparing the Passover lamb. Yeshua was being prepared as the Passover lamb. All right, prepared. Prepared. let's see. Peace of the earth. At the same time, at the same moment, what about 11, in three. this city, it started, it started at the top of 11, I and guess. And it was unrecognizable because Among the cloven of the Jews. That's what Isaiah is saying. Clothes and hose. All right, the camel. So shall he it has. Uh, it chews its cud. The, it does the not have cloven hose. It is unclean to you. The rock I wreck. The right. It is a. It chews its cud, but does not have cloven hooves. It is unclean to you. The hair, which is actually a mistranslation to me. Um. From Yeshua Hamashiach. And whatever the last one is. The swine. And the swine. Okay. It has a four animals. Split of. Those are only four you can't eat. It says these four. It doesn't say they're going to be more. It says these four. So there's no other animals on earth that... Exactly, that's my point. So therefore, if one person finds okay, well, can I, can another I tell, animal... Can I tell you what that is? Because I know what that is. Okay, that okay. right there, yeah. I've often wondered how. Maybe you've wondered this. How these Sadducees, you know the Sadducee, they don't, I think there's no resurrection. Yeah. They're Sadducees. Did you ever hear that one Wait, before? Which one's the Sadducee? Okay. They were the ones that didn't believe in resurrection back in the day. They were Jews that did not believe in resurrection. Okay. They're, old Sadducees. They're like politically liberal Jews back in Jesus' time. Nice. Yeah. And I've wondered how in the world could they ever believe such a thing based on Scripture? You know what the answer is? Go for it. It's the cult. The Roman Catholic spirit of hyper-literalism applied to verses of Scripture where God and prophets like Jeremiah and others places oh, talked about putting people and giving them a perpetual sweet. A man of they would actually a take a hyper-literal spirit and apply it to that, just like right. you're doing right there. That's a hyper-literal spirit. I have, I have a quick as you say, there were no other animals besides them. I have a quick question about that. Um, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't say there's only four. It no, does. But in the there, Hebrew, it does. It says still, only it these four. four. Yeah, only these four, like you said. But still. I have a question about that. Which one are we? Huh? The Jews of today, then, they're the Sadducees, now. and oh, are we the Sadducees, or are we the... I, I don't know, I don't know enough about you to be good at it. No, 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 like, they call, it, rabbi, they call it rabbinic Judaism, he right? Okay, the so Sadducees the and, and the Pharisees, so technically speaking, we, we would be the Pharisees the in this. But well, I, I, I would, curious, I would I think that the ultra-Orthodox Jews would be the Pharisees. The Pharisees, yeah. okay, so we're not in that camp. Sadducees, I don't think so, I mean, Sadducees would be more like people who probably believe that abortion's okay. Surely you should believe in the resurrection. Like the Karaites in that sense. Probably. Yeah. Like just in the <laughs> written, not yeah. in the world. Yeah. Okay. The first so, time I have it. But I'm not categorizing people today that's as fine, people that's like fine, that. That's fine. Right. So I, I started off with, with a question. What do you do so now as an I want to start with the same question because I just I have a very hard time with it. I don't understand it. I think you could answer it and illuminate a lot for me. Okay. So. I don't know what kind of Christian you are. Thing. I would assume because you're from the South, maybe Baptist, sin. but nope. I could be wrong. No, not even close. Okay. I'm just curious. Yeah, that's fine. He's just a Bible-believing Christian, right? Just a Bible-believing Christian. Okay. Scripture. So, God didn't ordain do you, that. does your did like, sect of Christianity no do. say, don't listen to the rabbis because the rabbis lie? Is that is that a, a phrase, per se? I don't, I, 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 I don't have a problem listening to the rabbis. You don't have a problem listening to the rabbis. So then in, fact, why? You, in fact, you just said that, that uh, regarding the Pharisees and religious leaders, that yeah. you can listen to them, just don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. Yes, exactly. So he said you can listen to them, you just couldn't do what they do. 
Okay. Because they were hypocrites. They, and they, okay. if they're teaching the law accurately, okay. it's okay to hear what they're saying. Okay. You have to judge what they're saying. You can't just receive what someone says and believe it as truth. You have to judge it for yourself. I hear that. And the scripture is called being a Berean. Because the people of Berea, when the Apostle Paul came to them, okay. and he taught them the truth from the Old Testament, okay. they checked everything he said. They were Jews. Okay. Checked everything he said against the Old Testament okay. to see whether it was true or not. Okay. And he didn't put them down for that. Okay. He, he actually and he told called them noble for that. I hear that. A young that man without blemish. Right, just kind of like what we did. Yeah, we checked it. Yeah, we checked it. I feel like we should check everything that's right. that's that right. we have. Right? Well, let me clarify one more thing for you, Clay. Case this is a stumbling block. Okay. When I talk about the Roman Catholic it's spirit of hyperliminalism, in case you don't know what I mean, Jesus said the Last because Supper, he talked about how he eateth eat, eat my flesh and drinketh my blood of eternal life. Okay. When the Roman Catholic Church tries to say it, that means he was telling us to literally eat his flesh and literally drink his blood. That's what I mean by hyperliminalism. And you know Jesus was not saying that? Because as the Messiah, as God manifested in the flesh, he came out to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Okay. And he was very well aware of the fact that the law of Moses condemns the consuming of literal blood. And Moshe okay. obeyed. And the so that's what I mean by the Roman Catholic spirit of hyper literal. Passed over. Passed okay. Over. So you're saying the sacrifice is more or less. I don't know what he's saying. Okay. Am I saying what? Like the sacrifice system. Yes. And okay. What I'm saying is Jesus never wanted anybody to literally drink his blood, is what I'm saying, or literally eat his flesh, I like they teach. But that's why it's pretty too soon. Unleavened bread. Because ultimately, if you thought that's what we were encouraging you to do, I can understand why you would be a little I slow. I didn't say that. Those are not my words. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jesus uses hyperbole sometimes. But no, that's a stumbling block, though, for a lot of people. I, th I think a lot of, I, I like, um, what's it? Tehillim. Who? Uh, Tehillim. The, 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 no, just, the, it's combined of, of songs, the book of Psalms. Psalms, okay. Psalms? I don't know. Psalms. That's what we call it. A, a lot of that is, is figurative speech. That's right? exactly and right. It's poetic speech. Shir, yes. Shir, um, yes. That would be songs of song. Yeah, psalm and, yeah. Song of songs, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, so a lot of Proverbs, is, too? Is, is yes. Proverbs, too? Yes. Proverbs has proverbial literature. Yes. 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 So we have to I'm be sure careful. That one is. Yes. Proverbs is the book of Proverbs. Got the Hebrew name. Solomon wrote it, most of it. Mishlech. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm right around the same page now. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. A lot of it is, I, I hear that. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Okay. Proverbs 1 7, I believe. Okay. So, so what you're saying, because because I, I think there's, just like there's an umbrella over the category of Jewish, there's an umbrella over the category of Christian, and under that umbrella, there's so many different Now, see, here's, here, here's the thing where you, I might be a little different than what you're used to, okay? Okay, go ahead. I, I don't think Catholics are Christians, okay. okay, even though they call themselves that. Okay, right? they have an extra book. I do know that. But. Well, it's not just an extra book. They have a lot of false doctrine, okay? They don't have the way of salvation. That's through grace, by grace, through faith okay. in Jesus. And okay. being born again, they don't have that either. No, they don't. So, Okay. And there's also a lot of professing Christians who have good doctrine, but they don't live according to the commandments of God. They're not obeying God, and God commands you to obey Him. Okay. So if someone's constantly living in sin, they're a hypocrite. They're not right with God. I hear that. So, right, but God also, I mean, in, in Devarim, it also says to listen to the rabbis. Listen to the rabbis. That's what it says. Where does it say that? I think it's Devarim chapter 30, verse 12 or 17. That's Proverbs? No. Uh, 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 Psalms? Fifth book. Uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, okay. Well, I mean, when it comes to, like, the Old Testament scriptures, okay. as a New Covenant Christian, okay. I have a different perspective on them than you would. Okay. Okay? I interpret them in light of the New Testament. New Testament takes preeminence in my life at the Old Testament. Okay? okay. Old Testament is, is obviously... Wait, I'm, I'm a little... Can you... I don't get that. Allusion. New Testament is Matthew through Revelation. Right, right. I had, yeah. I, I got that. So, so but what you're saying is that you use that to translate the, the Old not Testament? Not translate it, no, to interpret it, to understand it. To interpret it. it. To understand it. Okay, but it doesn't... Uh, so, like, I'm not required to keep the, the... I think it's James. Doesn't James say that the Bible is not a hard man's interpretation? What? It might, it might not be James. It's, it's Peter. Yeah. Peter. Yeah. And, okay, and Peter actually doesn't say that. He said it's not private interpretation. Yes. Okay, so and if, and what's it's really, the difference between your and, private and, and, and okay, your but the interpretation word, and, and... But the word in Greek that says interpretation means origin. And it's okay. talking about prophecy. There's no private origin. So real prophecy has an origin in God, yes. not okay. in man. And there's okay. only one correct interpretation. So, that's so God's interpretation. But we're talking about... Now we're talking about prophecy, right? 
That's what that scripture you just quoted talks about. That's okay. why I brought it up. So if we're talking about that, right, then how can we say, oh, you see that Jesus in all these different prophecies in the Old Testament, but it's not up to your interpretation? Like, whose interpretation is it up to then to say this is talking about Jesus? Okay, so but anytime it comes to someone like a, who's a Jewish person or, or right. Catholic, yeah. especially. I'm just curious. No, no, I'm just, I'm just giving you, a, it, it, there's similarities there because okay. the, the question has become is what is the ultimate authority? Okay, in the Roman Catholic Church, it's okay. the Pope, okay. it's the priest, okay. and the people in Roman Catholicism think, well, I need them to interpret it for me. That's what they believe. And scripture doesn't okay. teach that. Okay. You obviously believe that the rabbis are exalted. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say exalted. Well, I mean, above your interpretation there. Mm, I wouldn't say that either. You can interpret it beside them? No, I, would, I would say it that we have like 2,000 years of written uh, commentary. Sure. I don't think it, I think commentary interpretation is different because we have a commentator called the Ramban. But isn't a commentary uh, an interpretation of scripture? Uh, I think it's an elucidation. Do you think there's a difference? I think you're splitting hairs there. I really do. I thought he was splitting hair on, hairs on a few things too. I, I, I think you're calling a tangerine an orange. I think you're doing. Okay, well, okay, so let's say this, right? So what happens when one argues with another? So we have a, a commentator called the Ramban, yeah. and he argues with another commentator called Rashi, okay. and a lot of different things. Yeah. So who's to say, you know, you listen to one over the other? Well, that's, that's the thing. Right? You're getting, you're getting so, so to a, the ultimate authority once again. That's what I was talking about right, a second ago. Right, that's what I'm saying. But uh, Who determines we, ultimate authority, we, then? We, we have an expression, God determines ultimate authority. Right, but I agree do, with that. How do you know that you're following what God says, right? Because God also says in Deuteronomy that there will be false prophets. Yep. And what do you said the same thing. What do you do with the false prophet? Well, in the Old Testament, you stole them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. New Testament, you Seven, rebuke them. Seven, these, please. Yeah. No, so, no, 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 not that. They, oh. We got this group over here. Can I have some of these? Oh, okay. So, so, um, so you have, or, um, my question for you is, in yeah, that situation, yeah. how do you determine who's right and who isn't? How do I determine? Because you're hearing both of them, right? I I, I, get, I hear a lot more than both of them. Well, I'm just saying, let's, let's, that's that example you gave a second ago. You're hearing right. those two. So who do you, how do you decide who's right and who's wrong? How do you decide who's right and who's wrong? Yeah. Who's to say one's wrong? Well, if they disagree, one's got to be wrong. Or both are both wrong, at least. Why? Why can't they both be right? If they disagree? Yeah. How can they both be right? <laughs> so you guys have developed a paradox theology where two people can be right at the same time and believe different things. Well, can I ask you this? That's absurd. It, okay, so you're standing here mm -hmm. and something happens over there, yep. right? It's a big boom. I have a visual over there, what's well, your back, right? And now what happens and our reactions are going to be drastically different. But that doesn't change what happened, though. It the fact, at what happened, well, happened. I think at the same time, all the people over there, they're going to be three sides to every story. Okay, but here's the thing, though. Right. If we're talking about, like, if we go up to the corner here, okay. and there's a car accident. Okay. And there's a person on every corner. Yeah. They all see different perspectives exactly. of the accident. Okay. But there's if, they, if what they're saying, one guy says it's a blue car. Mm -hmm. One guy says it's a red car. Okay. One guy says it's a yellow car. They okay. can't all be right at the same time. But well, they're can saying, we say, well, can we say that what this person said, this guy sped up. This person said, this guy uh, stopped short. Yeah. This person said, um, yeah, he didn't slow down. Yeah, there's no problem with right? this. Those things are so, not contradictory, though. That is contradictory. No, it's not. In, in, in the root of it. No. Because it goes down to whose fault is it? In, no, no. In, 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 it's not, it's not contradictory, though. Right. The red, think, the blue, and the yellow, think, that's contradictory. I don't, think, I don't think that Rashi and, and the Ramban are contradicting itself. Okay, well, that's different then. So if I'm talking about things where they disagree, okay, and they're what they're saying is like the opposite of each other. The law of non-contradiction. No, no, they're not the opposite of each other. Okay, okay. So, but, the law of, the but the law of logic, you know, logic is a, it's a reflection of God's mind. Okay, and one law of logic is law of non-contradiction. Okay. So two, you can't have two different answers to the same question in the same instance, and they both be right at the same time. Either one's wrong, or they're both wrong. Why can't both of them be right? Because they're a different answer to the same but question. But they can have the same root as that. No, that's, correct. that's not what I'm talking about. Like two plus two can't equal four and five at the same time. I hear that. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. So, uh, going back, I remember what it was. So Deuteronomy says, don't listen to a false prophet, right? Who's to say who's a real prophet, who's not a real prophet? How do you determine? Okay, so so now now you're talking about something that's more absolute because. Can I actually give okay. an answer to that? I, actually, I'm gonna give an answer. Go to ahead. That. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's it's more absolute. Okay, we're not just talking about 
perspectives now or perception okay. of things Fine. or things that can be maybe both be right like okay. you're talking about earlier we're talking about this is cut and dry okay if a guy says your shoe is coming back tomorrow he doesn't come three days go by he's still not here okay he's a false prophet okay. there's no if ands buts about that okay and according to old testament yes. what happens to him he gets thrown yes. to death uh, yes anyway, you said comes back soon. exactly dead, but no 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 not coming back no, soon no, no, i don't get that what if he already died and then you say he's coming back and he doesn't come back then that's a false prophet that's exactly okay. exactly yeah okay so he, i mean according to old testament he deserves to die for that right okay yeah so that, right. that that's we're talking about false prophets. this is stuff that's testable okay. You can okay. you can test it against the scripture. So, so who gives the tests? Well, anyone with a mind can test it. A false prophecy. If they say it's not when prophecy is given in scripture, it's not vague and ambiguous. Or do you mean who gives the standards? It's, it, 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 it's, it's very true, it's very specific. It's not true. It is. All prophecies come in dreams. It says it. Wait, where did it, it say it, that? It says yeah, it, where, in, in Daniel, all his prophecies are through dreams. Well, that was in, da I mean, in, Daniel. Maybe not all prophecies come through dreams. No. That's not true. You're right. Moses doesn't. But mo but it can. It can come through dreams, but not necessarily. But it's not clear. It's not It's not like God is talking uh, like you and I are talking. Okay, and, so. And there would be no lost messages. But, but, it's, it's like there would be images or, or, you know, two words. Okay, now, know, there's, no, there's no there problem there things. being apocalyptic how do, stuff. How do you test it? Okay, but what I was saying is, how do you say when it, this when it person comes, is real? You're, you're talking about the language being used and what they saw, not understanding it. Right. I'm okay. simply it talking about Samuel is a prophet. Yeah. Right. How did he become a prophet? By prophesying. Okay. How do you know it was right? It came to pass. It came to pass. So what happens if if um, Samuel gave a prophet that didn't come to pass, or he gave a prophet that is to come in the future, but it was so far out? That it didn't actually come through during his life. Yes, so to be determined. I could, I could say this: right? Yet to be determined. Jesus died before the third base of Migdash was, was built. He even died before the second base of Migdash was destroyed, the temple. He died before the second. Uh, Eighty seven, yeah. Right, and so Jesus died in seven. No, no, no the temple, temple was destroyed, destroyed in eighty seventy. Right. Just died Jesus about thirty two. About thirty two. Okay, around okay. that. We don't know the exact time. Okay, so he was as Mashiach, he's a uh, Messiah. He's supposed to rebuild the third temple. How can you rebuild the third temple if the second one's still standing? Well, I don't know if scripture says he's supposed to build a third temple. It says that there, there are certain qualifications that the Mashiach has to do. Well, I don't, I don't know of any prophecy that says he has to build a third temple, but I'll, I'll say to you is this. He also has to bring world peace. Everybody, everybody well, agrees that. Well, he's going to bring world peace, he brings world destruction. He's going to do that in his second coming, not his first say, coming. It doesn't necessarily say that. It does say that, yeah. Yeah. Where do you get that from? Okay, well, the, the scripture talks about in Revelation, all throughout it. Yeah. It talks about how he's going to come and destroy the wicked. And Daniel does too. It, it talks about uh, how Jerusalem will be surrounded in Zechariah 12 through 14. Okay. Come and destroy all the enemies of Israel, and he'll bring peace. I think that happened, though. You no, know, it has not happened. He hasn't destroyed, <laughs> he hasn't destroyed no. enemies of, of Israel. They're still here, man. They're still pointing guns at you, pointing yeah. missiles at you. They're still the here. The Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the no. Babylonians. And so how, how do we know you, Messiah did those things? How do we know Messiah? Well, I don't think he did those things. I don't you said the second go did. What do you mean? He's supposed to. Oh, he's supposed to. Yeah. So this is an this is issue that actually the first century people, Jews had it too. Okay, so they would, okay. even the Jesus' disciples had this issue. Okay. Where they thought he was going to establish his kingdom right there on the spot. Mm. Right? They thought that okay. you, you look at the language of what the questions they would ask him, even okay. right before he rose to heaven. I okay. said that in Acts chapter one, okay. he said, "Are you going to now restore the kingdom of God to Israel?" Okay. He said, "It's not for you to know the times and the seasons." Okay, that's very. So, and so, we see that throughout throughout. So, so even throughout they were confused about that, and okay. and when he didn't do those things immediately, a lot of people rejected him as the Messiah. But the Messiah had a first coming. See, the prophecies you're talking about is second coming. Well, how do, where does it say that there's going to be two comings? Well, Isaiah 53 talks about what's going to happen to him at his first coming. Can we read it? Yeah, we sure can. Okay. Of course. Can we start at 52, though? Of course we can. I don't, I don't know if it's next no to necessarily sure starting. Start there. There's no uh, problem. I mean, I, like I have no, I'm not trying to take anything out of context. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Well, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't Isaiah, like, 49 start talking about... Um, um, uh, uh, who is it? The king. Uh, the, the, uh, what you call it? I'm not sure. I don't have that memorized. Okay. Fine. But but you you can see you, once you start reading right here in Isaiah 52 okay. and verse 13. Yeah, there you go. Well, can I start? Read, you read whatever you want. You can read. I'm just I'm just telling you that was a good place to start. Okay.
has a kayak in it. Yeah, but keep reading. You gotta read all the way through the Isaiah 53. Okay. Maybe here a while. Do you have a time? It is 719. Cool. Okay. If you, I can think of something to take with you if you want instead. It talks about Isaiah 53. I, I mean, I have it. Yeah. Oh, you have it. You gotta read it. I, I have a lot. No, but this, this talks about Isaiah 53. Yeah, I know, but I, I have massive books that talk about it too. Okay, well, I'm just saying, this is this is from our perspective. I'm trying to get our I perspective on things, this is what I this gives to you. Yeah, just take a read. I mean, if, if you had to go, I mean, I understand. And I'm just going to tell you right now the easy way to rebuke the rabbinical interpretation that he says that by my, by his righteousness, my servant, so justify yeah, many, justify many by his knowledge. God in Isaiah explicitly condemns Israel in the context of chapter 5 for having no knowledge, and he says through Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So I cannot be talking about Israel. So, um, if you, Smoo, if you want to contact me, I have a website right there. There's another track. You can read that if you want. Um, it's good talking to you, man. I appreciate you talking to me. Anything. Stopping and talking to me. I enjoy having yeah. a peaceful time. Hey, man. Yeah. God yeah. bless you. Take care. Enjoy. God bless you, man. <laughs> the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 52. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. For they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my, of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has been put to he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors. 
and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. in God's face. This is that phrase, easy believers. Yep. It's like, this is the work of God that you believe on and whom he has sent. You're trying to tell me it's easy what he went through 2,000 years ago? Mm -hmm. okay. It's so easy. It explains why these people are so unthankful. They think it's so easy. No. The scriptures teach that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah of Israel. He is the King of Israel. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Son of God. He is God in flesh. Jesus is the name above every name. No matter how many people malign his name and curse his name and put down his name, the Father, Adonai, Hashem, Yahweh has given Jesus the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, Yeshua, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Take heed what you say. You'll give an account for every idle word. You'll give an account for every idle word. What comes out of your mouth shows the state of your heart. How hypocritical it is to be religious on the outside, be full of wickedness on the inside. How hypocritical it is to be full of wickedness on the inside and have it come out of your mouth and you do the wicked things, but you're so religious on the outside. It's not going to help you on Judgment Day. Yeshua said, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Yeshua, Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man. Out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Then Yeshua said this, But I say unto you, that for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Watch your mouth. God's going to judge you according to what comes out of your mouth. Because what comes out of your mouth reveals the state of your heart. If curses come out of your mouth, your heart is wicked. If curses come out of your mouth, your heart is wicked. But Yeshua Jesus, he can cleanse you of your sins and forgive you of your sins, give you a new heart and new desires. Yeshua calls it in John chapter 3 of the New Testament, being born again, where the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you and cleanses you from the inside out makes you a new creature in Christ. That's God's plan for you. Because Yeshua, Jesus, died for you on the cross. And he commands you to repent. And no amount of religious outward external deeds is going to help you on Judgment Day. It will not wash away your sins. Even though the blood of the animals in the Old Testament that were shed for sins and not wash away sins, then not cleanse of sins, otherwise they would cease to be offered. But Yeshua, Jesus' sacrifice was once for all, a one-time sacrifice for sins, to cleanse you of your sins, to make you a new person in Christ. 
For anyone who's in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. He wants to make you new. He wants to give you what you don't deserve, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, cleansing of sins. He offers it to you, but you must come to him in humility. You're full of pride. You're no different than Sodom and Gomorrah. And what did God do to them? God wiped them off the face of the planet. That's what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. And ironically, all the tours we have in Israel, of all the things found in the scripture, and Gomorrah is still there. Why don't we have tour groups to Gomorrah? I came here in 2019, went to Gomorrah myself, and found evidence of its destruction, found sulfur, sulfur balls in the middle of the desert, all over the place, still there, as a sign of what God did so long ago. In Zechariah chapter 12, it talks about the return of the Messiah when he comes to deliver Israel from all their enemies surrounding around them. It says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, I'll pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And what you see in this passage is that Israel will mourn for, the, for him who was pierced. And Yeshua, Hashem, uses the word me. They look on me whom they have pierced. Who's the me there? This is God talking. Zechariah 12, verse 10, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. That's, that's Hashem talking. It's Adonai talking. He goes on to say, Then they will look on me, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him, as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Scripture's obviously talking about Yeshua, Jesus, who died, who was pierced in his nails and in his feet and in his side. He had a crown of thorns on his head. He suffered and bled and died for you. And I can say for you because he died for all. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Yeshua loved you at the cross. You may not love him, you may despise him, you may hate him, you may curse him, but he showed his love for you at the cross when he laid down his life. And the wicked religious leaders of the Jews at that time rejected him, lied about him, turned him over to the Roman authorities, who then scourged him and whipped him and beat him. They punched him, they spat upon him, they mocked him, they scoffed him. They put a crown of thorns on his head, and they crucified him in his wrists and his feet. And he died on that Roman cross. Yeshua did. Jesus, he died on that cross. He died for you. That you would humble yourself. That you'd see your desperate need. Your need for him, your need for salvation, your need for mercy and forgiveness an eternal life. He offers it to you. Out of his love for you, out of his great kindness towards you, he offers it to you. Not because you deserve it, not because you're righteous, not because you've done well. You've sinned against God hundreds, thousands of times. You're deserving of the wrath and judgment of God. But because God loves, he offers you his grace. Because God loves, he offers you his mercy, his kindness, his forgiveness. But just like in the Old Testament, the only way you can receive forgiveness is through the sacrificial blood offered on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, once a year. 
That's gone now. There is no temple. There is no Ark of the Covenant. There is no Holy of Holies. There is no high priest. You have no sacrifice for sins. But Yeshua, Jesus, was the final sacrifice for sins. And he died on the Passover. Ironically, isn't it? The Passover lamb was slain for you. He was without leaven in his life. He was holy. He was pure, having never sinned, having always pleased the Father. Yeshua Jesus always pleased the Father, always did what was right, always obeyed. He fulfilled God's law. He's the perfect Jew. There'll never be a Jew more perfect than Jesus, Yeshua. Tell me a better Jew than one who rose the dead from the grave. Tell me a better Jew than Yeshua Jesus who gave the blind eyes to see, who gave the deaf ears to hear, who raised the dead, who cleansed the leper, who healed the sick. Tell me a greater Jew than that, than Yeshua Jesus. No, you're not. You're wicked. You're sinful. You've, you've broken God's law. You're in need of forgiveness yourself. Yeshua, not so. He kept God's law completely. He never broke God's law. He never even lied. Never even lusted after a woman. Yeshua was the perfect Jew. And then when he was around and people falsely accused him of many things, the Pharisees of that time accused him of being full of demons, of casting out demons in the, by the power of the devil. They falsely accused him of many things, just like today he's falsely accused of many things. And the people asked themselves, will someone greater than this come? And think of the prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah, Elisha, the miracles they did. Did any of them do the things Yeshua, Jesus did? Did they raise themselves from the grave like Yeshua, Jesus did? You mock and scoff sinner, you'll give an account for that. That, that cross that he died on is the only hope you have. The only hope you have for mercy and grace and forgiveness from Hashem is through what Yeshua did on the cross. You mock the cross to your own detriment. That cross is precious not because it's wood, because Yeshua shed his precious blood there. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Leviticus 17.11 says, I've given the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. For it is the blood that makes atonement for sins. Amen. This is the truth. And you have no blood sacrifice, and therefore you have no forgiveness. And you reject the only sacrifice there is. What's that? I'm not Catholic. Nice try. It's a false accusation. I reject the Roman Catholic Church. They're false. They're fraudulent. They're going to hell themselves. There's probably corruption in every religious institution around the world. And every single one of them will give an account to God for their life. You will give an account to God for your life, for every thought, word, and deed. Even the things done in darkness that you hide from everybody else, maybe even successfully hide from others, God sees it. His eyes are on the ways of men, and he sees all their steps. There is no darkness, no shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. What the scripture teaches. He sees what you do. You can mock, you can scoff, you can laugh all you want. It's not going to do you good on Judgment Day. The scripture says when Yeshua returns, when Jesus returns, by his grace and his love alone, he will stomp out the enemies of Israel, the 200 million man army who surround Israel in the end, he will stomp them out by the sword of his mouth. The scripture says in Zechariah 14, that their eyes will melt from their sockets, their tongues will melt from their mouth, their flesh will melt off their body. That's what Yeshua will do when he returns to the enemies of Israel. 
But don't think you can say to yourself that you're right with God simply because of your lineage, simply because of who you belong to, who your parents, your grandparents, or your great-great-great-grandparents are. That doesn't make you right with God. Being right with God is individual, not corporate, not national. It's individual. It is. In Isaiah 55, the Lord, Hashem, says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Salvation is individual, not corporate, not national. Individual. You need to get right with God. You need to give up your sins. You need to be washed from your past sins. If you have no cleansing of your past sins, then you're still in your sin. And you have not the mercy of God. God has made a way for you to receive forgiveness of sins, to receive his mercy, to receive cleansing. Isaiah 1 talks about it. It says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you are willing and obedient. I think I'm done for tonight, bro. Yeah. I actually get hungry too. Yeah, let's go. It's good.